So as we look at lactose, it, we know that it's a sugar that's in dairy products. And but people wonder, why are so many people lactose intolerant if it's natural? If we look at the lactose levels, we see that it's, it's much higher in yogurts and in reduced fat milks and in ice cream in terms of uh, proportion. And we see that lactose intolerance is highest in countries that were the last to get dairy in their agriculture. So 10,000 years ago when we started agriculture, it largely it spread west and east from the Middle East and they started to produce more dairy. And we see the least amount of lactose intolerance in these northern regions, which largely relied on dairy to last throughout the winters. We still see a prevalence of lactose intolerance around the world, as high as 100% in South America, in Sub-Saharan Africa, and Eastern Asia. We see milk consumption per capita that Finland, Sw Sweden, Netherlands, Switzerland are all very high in milk consumption per person too. So what about cheese? Who consumes cheese? Um, I created this graph actually from data um, that France consumes the most cheese next to Finland and Germany and we'll see how that may affect them. And ice cream. The average American consumes almost 22 pounds of ice cream per year. That's a crazy number. Right next to New Zealand, which is at 28.4 liters of ice cream per year. So let's talk a little bit more about this ice cream and frozen yogurts. So it's an easily overconsumed delicacy, likely linked to the obesity epidemic. The nutrition facts on dairy ice cream, we see that saturated fat is equivalent to three cups of milk, which is crazy, and just half a cup of ice cream. And the sugar is over the limit for most people. Now if you're eating it for protein, why not just go for peanut butter? The recommended sugar intake is much lower than we think. If we look at the average American consumption of sugar, it's more than two times the amount, or sometimes even three for women, the amount of sugar that we should have per day in grams. So it's important to watch how much we have. Consuming more than recommended can lead to obesity and major diseases such as diabetes, cancer, heart disease, and Alzheimer's. It's a funny picture. I feel the end approaching. Quick, bring me my dessert, coffee and liquor. Haha, so it's just dairy, right? So I'll have a cake, chocolate, candy, cookie instead. Sweet! Not so fast. Let's, uh, let's look at the research here. Since 1776, the amount of sugar we've been having per year has been rising exponentially from 4 pounds, just about 200 years ago, to 120 pounds per person per year. That's insane. Obesity has it's been rising since 1999 and and it's even in our youth. And it's not just in the US, it's around the world. But the highest in the US and Australia and some in the Middle East and England. Still want sweets? Add more fruits with fiber, which releases the sugar much more slowly. So this isn't just about adults, it's about our children. Milk accelerates hormone systems unfavorably as a whole, accelerating the onset of puberty and menopause. We'll be talking about type 1 diabetes, type 2 diabetes, and acne three problems that are affecting our children around the world. Type 1 diabetes is said to be caused through genetics. 
but in reality, under 5% of people with their diabetic genes will ever overtly become or have diabetes type 1. So we need to see what we can do to prevent that. So if we have children growing up with cow milk, we notice that they develop antibodies to the bovine insulin in the milk. So there's a, there's a big molecule on the left over here that resembles our pancreatic beta cells that may cause us to attack our pancreas and thereby leading to a autoimmune diabetes type 1 uh, disease. So we see that it's not just in our in our cow milk, but it's also in our commercial infant formulas. So overconsumption of sugar, mainly over 22 grams of sugar per day, which is their limit, leads to an overworking of their pancreas. Our pancreas has two main cells, or three. As you can see from the green duct on the left, that it produces enzymes to break down foods, the, the fats and the proteins, but then it also produces, with its beta cells, insulin, which is a hormone that goes straight into our bloodstream. Now, we'll see that insulin, insulin is what helps to lower the amount of sugar in our bloodstream. But when we have too much sugar in a day, it's overworking our pancreas and it's getting expensive. Type 2 diabetes is linked to obesity, almost as expensive as armed violence, war, and terrorism. Acne is a $350 million market. It largely occurs from inflammation of our hair follicles and the oil glands that are in our Largely dermis. due to two things. Insulinotropic foods or foods that cause an insulin spike or hormones. Now, the insulin spike foods are foods like juice, dairy products, and refined sugar or grain. So it's important to have whole grains to, to sort of offset the, the spike in insulin that happens after we have refined grains. So we're talking about wheat, whole wheat, whole oats and whole barley and um, whole brown rice and corn. Epidemiological studies found that the incidence of colon cancer is lowest in diets and populations where they eat the highest amount of fiber and whole grains. We see from having just two glasses a day that your risk of having acne is 44% higher than if you didn't. Our top chart is from skim milk. So total milk actually had lower acne risk, but acne is probably the least of our concern in terms of global health. Of greater priority is cancer. It's much more expensive. It takes the lives of so many people. Breast cancer and prostate cancer are hormone dependent diseases and dairy cows are forced to produce milk almost continuously. So they're pregnant most of their lives producing their milk. So it's said that breast cancer is caused by an oncogene. But when you look at the stats, it's really less than 10% of cases. So what about the other 90%? 37% of the prevalence of breast cancer comes from bovine leukemia virus found in 84% of dairy operations. In general though, the smaller the farm, the lower the prevalence. We see that this uh, virus is found in women with breast cancer, 59% compared to 29%. Now that's a difference of about 30% of people. So the second cause of breast cancer are all of the hormones that are present within it. Now. Although growth hormone and estrogen are essential for ductal development, mammary glands should be decreasing in size post-menopause, but the hormone levels within milk are keeping it um, larger, causing the breast cancer. It's most frequently prescribed as an oral hormone replacement for menopause, so it's said that it would decrease their symptoms of menopause, but 
we know that it's a known carcinogen. Now this is known. There are warning labels on these replacement therapies. Current breast cancer treatments are anti-estrogen, are trying to decrease the amount of estrogen. So what is estrogen? Think of it as a lipid. It's a type of fat. It's a steroid ring-shaped molecule. And it's fat soluble so it can go through our phospholipid bilayer in our cells and it can go straight to the nucleus and in our nucleus has our DNA. So our estrogen might be affecting all of the proteins that are regulating our DNA and thereby causing cancer. There's a large body of research talking in depth about this. But in it's found in, in large amounts in dairy products and especially milk. See, just one cup has 2,400 picograms of estrogen. We know that it's a known carcinogen causing uterine cancer, breast, and ovarian cancers. Although skim milk has less estrogen, it's still as effective in mammary tumor promotion. And our current breast cancer treatments try to block the action of estrogen on breast cancer cells. Similarly, polycystic ovarian syndrome may also be linked to uh, our estrogen levels from our dairy products, 22%. The highest odds ratio is from our cheeses, and then right under that is our milk and yogurt. So IGF-1 is considered to be a protein. So as we know from our biology class um, in our cell cycle, it's highly regulated. And when a growth factor binds to, to the cell, it causes a phosphorylation cascade and causes the release of cyclin and CDK, which ultimately cause the cell to grow and the DNA to synthesize. However, IGF-1 inhibits our little checkpoints right here that regulate the cell growth. So IGF-1 is causing the cell to continuously go through its cell cycle, which as we know is cancer, which is unrestricted cell division. So it's found in all dairy products at concentrations above 30 um, nanograms per milliliter. So we know that it's linked to breast cancer and prostate cancer at low concentrations of just one nanogram. Yogurt has four times less IGF-1 than milk, so yogurt may be a better alternative from milk in terms of IGF-1 levels. Hormones, though, and growth factors are consumed by fast-growing infants. Now, if we think about it, the products, these dairy products, are for fast-growing infant cows. So, why are we getting cancer? Maybe because it's meant to grow a baby cow into a cow. 400 pound heifer. How much do you want to weigh? But it's not even just about weight. It's about our risks of cancer. These are the levels of IGF-1. So follow the numbers here. So your age, your sex, and then go down to the level. This is this is the level that um, that you should be at. And the IGF-1 levels, like we saw, 7,200 nanograms, is much higher than what we have normally, and seems to make sense why we have super high levels of IGF-1 and subsequently high levels of cancer. In an average population, our rates of prostate cancer rise as we get older and are highest in our mid-50s and 60s, uh, medium, median age at 66. So we see that prostate cancer is clearly happening and we are doing something wrong. So we need to decrease our risks of getting prostate cancer and there are things that we could do to do that. So the Prostate Cancer Foundation even says that when Asian men migrate to Western countries, their risk of getting prostate cancer increases substantially. And they believe that the major risk factor is diet, foods that produce oxidative damage.
but a lot more than diet. It's our habits, what we've been taught to believe and what we've been taught to eat. Estrogen has been found to be the genotoxic role of estrogens on the prostate gland is substantial. Our relative risk of developing prostate cancer when drinking milk is about two times as likely. And why we remember the estrogen has a direct effect on our DNA regulation. It's also linked to male infertility.